I think we'll get them back another time. Uh, we move to topical questions. Question number one, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what recent representations it has made to the UK Government regarding the removal of the right of householders in Scotland to object to fracking taking place beneath their homes. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government formally responded to the United Kingdom Government's consultation on underground drilling access rights on 14 August 2014. The Scottish Government formally opposed the UK Government's proposals to remove landowners' rights in respect of drilling under their land on the basis that matters of such gravity should be a decision for the people of Scotland through the Scottish Parliament. Angus Macdonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. A significant number of my constituents are concerned regarding the dash for gas being pursued by Westminster and are extremely disappointed that their views are being disregarded by the UK Government. Riding roughshod over public opinion and removing householders' rights without adequate debate is not good government. With 99% of respondents to UK consultation objecting to the plans, can the Cabinet Secretary give me and my constituents an assurance that the Scottish Government will continue to look at the issue of unconventional gas extraction in a cautious, considered and evidence-based fashion, as opposed to the gung-ho attitude of the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. President, officer, I, I, I can give Mr Macdonald the assurance that the Scottish Government will continue what we have been doing throughout our handling of this issue, which is to look at the issues raised by um, unconventional uh, gas opportunities in an evidence-based, um, evidence-led process. Uh, that has been demonstrated by our appointment of the independent expert scientific panel, um, who reported in July of this year, and also evidence in the decisions that we took in relation to the strengthening of planning policy with the five new measures in relation to hydraulic frac fracturing, including bringing in a requirement that development should only proceed if communities and the environment can be protected. And that will be the approach that we continue to take. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his further reply. Given the UK Government has not only ignored the representations made by the Scottish Government, but also the representations made by 99% of the respondents uh, to their own consultation, does he agree with me that all of the powers in relation to unconventional oil and gas should be devolved, as suggested by Andrew Tyree, MP, Chair of the Treasury Select Committee, only last week? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the, well, Mr McDonald won't be surprised to hear that I, I, I am a supporter of uh, all of these relevant powers being devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And I think what the issues that are raised by the UK Government's response to this consultation um, highlight the necessity for decision-making by politicians to be taken in accordance and in proximity to the uh, aspirations and outlook and perspective of the people that they affect. And uh, I think it's a matter of regret that such an overwhelming evidence base that's been submitted to the UK Government's consultation um, has not been followed by the decision that's been taken by the UK Government. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Scottish Government, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, has overall power over planning. Uh, which has already enabled the Scottish Government to prevent the development of the nuclear industry. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary in relation to devolved planning issues how the Scottish Government is going to be taking forward the details of guidance to ensure this is robust and recognise the environmental concerns of my constituents in South Scotland and across Scotland in relation to unconventional gas extraction? Cabinet Secretary. What I would say to Claudia Beamish, and I, I recognise the, the issues that she raises, that the Governments, an indication of the government's approach was given in the approach that we've taken in the formulation of the national planning framework and the Scottish planning policy. And the Scottish planning policy extracts at sections 245 and 246 give some further detail on the way in which the government will proceed in developing some of the further guidance. Obviously, on um, issues of this nature, um, their uh, individual planning applications are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there is one that um, is with reporters at this present moment, um, and obviously the issues that are relevant to the Scottish planning policy will be implicit in that determination. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for the answers he's given previously and say that I'm reassured by those. But can I get, have an understanding with the Minister here that when we take this forward, we will do so on an evidence-based 
decision-making process and that we will not give in to the misinformation and the conspiracy theories that seem to abound among those who oppose fracking for no other reason than that they believe it's a dangerous or bad idea. This is a, a huge opportunity for Scotland. Will he give me the assurance that this will be done by you, the use of common sense? Well, what, I, what I can do for, uh, for Mr Johnson is simply reiterate the, the answer I gave to Mr Macdonald, and, and it's the same answer, that the Government will continue in a considered and evidence-based way. That is how we've structured our approach to this particular issue. It's why I think it is regrettable that the UK Government has taken the decision to uh, overrule the legitimate rights of individuals to raise their concerns in this matter, which applies throughout the planning process um, and uh, the work that the, um, the expert panel did for the Scottish Government I think was highly informative of some of the steps that need to be taken to handle this issue because uh, whilst I, 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 I recognise the enthusiasm that Mr Johnson expresses for this issue we also have to be mindful there are many many people in our country um, have concerns about unconventional um, opportunities I wish to be assured that proper and due process will be applied in all circumstances, and I can confirm to Parliament that will be the case. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Pretty extraordinary to hear concerns about adding to the stocks of fossil fuels as a conspiracy theory, given that 99% of the consultation respondees have got more sense than that, and given that opinion polling shows a stronger opposition to these measures in Scotland than in any other part of the UK. Surely it matters not just whether this decision is made in Westminster or in Holyrood, but whether it is made at all. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that if the power to make this decision is brought to Holyrood, his government will oppose the action that the UK government has already indicated it supports for the UK as a whole? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can say to uh, Mr Harvey is that the Scottish Government does not support the removal of the rights of householders to object to oil and gas drilling and hydraulic fracking fracturing beneath their homes. Um, we've been very clear about that point and if we had the opportunity to do something different we would, do, we would, take, uh, the, uh, we would take the opposite step. Um, in relation to the wider issue, um, we have set out that uh, there are a whole variety of complex issues that have to be wrestled with here. That is why we take an evidence-based and, cons evidence and considered approach to the resolution of all of those issues. I think that's what people would expect of government, and that's what I think is regrettable about the decision of the UK government to ignore the evidence in response to this consultation and to proceed to remove the rights of objection for householders, uh, which I think will only fuel unease about these issues rather than address the unease that has been expressed on this point. Question two, Alice McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on Police Scotland's decision not to make the details of the cost of policing the Commonwealth Games public. Cabinet Secretary Sheila Robinson. Uh, Police Scotland has not made any decision to withhold the cost of Commonwealth Games policing. The process of finalising the figures for the use of the Commonwealth Safety and Security Budget is currently ongoing, and as a result, it would be inappropriate to release the figures at this stage. Police Scotland is absolutely clear about the need for transparency and accountability for spending public money and has assured the Scottish Government that once the figures have been finalised, the details of the safety and security budget will be published without prejudice. Alice McInnes. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Police Authority's Finance and Investment Committee is meeting as we speak and in closed session it is receiving an update on the cost of Commonwealth Games. You know, it doesn't matter how often the SPA meets in public, it's by looking at what it chooses to hide and what it opts to receive in private that we can test whether it's meeting its obligations. Um, knowing how the money is spent is key to maintaining the confidence. When will the public be told the final cost of the security of the Games? It is just worth uh, reminding um, the, the member that Police Scotland's line of accountability for the safety and security budget is to the Scottish Government with regard uh, to this matter. But of course, um, the SPA considers papers in private when figures are not yet finalised. Uh, these figures are not yet finalised. They will be finalised as soon as possible, but it surely uh, would not be right to put figures into the public domain that are not yet finalised. But I can assure Alison McInnes that as soon as they are, uh, then they will be put into the public domain and it will be the, the SPA will, of course, be able to revisit the matter should they wish. 
Alison McInnes. Thank you very much. Can the Cabinet Secretary um, give us an early indication of whether the Games come within the £90 million budget or whether overtime, time off in lieu and the movement of officers around the country cost uh, overran? Uh, well, we are um, very confident, and Police Scotland is very confident, that the, the total spend will be within the £90 million allocated for safety and security. Um, I should also put on record again uh, our appreciation for the officers uh, involved and their great efforts uh, during the Commonwealth Games. We are an absolute credit uh, to, uh, to Police Scotland and to the country. Um, I should just also add that all overtime payments uh, will uh, be met from the safety and security uh, budget. And as I said at the start of my answer, uh, Police Scotland uh, does not expect the, the total spend to exceed the £90 million budget allocated for safety and security. Sandra White. <laughs> thank you very much, President Officer. And I thank the Cabinet for her reply. And I'm sure that uh, Alice McInnes will get some of these answers at the subcommittee on police, which she sits on. But I was more than interested in picking up on the point that uh, Cabinet regarding about the police and the work that they carried out. Uh, I thought the police carried out a fantastic job during the Commonwealth Games. And bear in mind your comments, I just wondered, Cabinet Secretary, if these thoughts had been relayed to all of staff as well in Police Scotland for the fine work that they did carry out during the Commonwealth Games. Yes, absolutely, um, because um, it's important that, uh, that we recognise that, uh, as well as those on the front line, there were a lot of uh, uh, people, officers uh, and uh, civilians involved behind the scenes as well. I sent out a, a personal thank you to, to all of the, the agencies involved and asked that that be relayed uh, across the board to those who helped to deliver um, the most successful Commonwealth Games ever, as uh, described by the Commonwealth Games Federation. Uh, without the, 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 the dedication, not just of our police officers, but of course the, the fire uh, service as well, the uh, health service, the ambulance service, all of these really important uh, services uh, were first class and helped us deliver not just a, a fantastic Commonwealth Games, but a safe and secure one as well. And I think that's appreciated by everybody. Margaret Mitchell. Presiding officer, while the Police Scotland did do an excellent job, uh, is the Minister aware that many MSPs have been contacted by serving police officers regarding what they consider to be unreasonable demands placed on them in order to ensure the Commonwealth Games were policed? This potentially raises some ethical issues. Can the Minister therefore confirm if Police Scotland has put in place a process for whistleblowers that ensures that any such potential ethical or indeed criminal wrongdoing is highlighted an appropriate act? is taken. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say, I, I think for, for the vast majority of police officers, this will be seen as a, a once in a career opportunity to be involved in such a, a fantastic uh, event uh, as the Commonwealth Games. Um, I should also say that uh, um, the plans around uh, things like uh, uh, toil and uh, over, well, I've dealt with overtime payments, but things like toil and rest days, um, plans that have been put in place with the support of the Police Federation to allow officers extended time to take any outstanding rest days that they may have accrued. So some of the practicalities uh, have certainly been dealt with. I mean, in terms of if an individual officer felt that there were undue pressures being put upon them, then that is obviously a matter for Police Scotland uh, to take forward. I would hope that those cases would very much be in a minority because the feedback I've had from the vast majority of officers involved was it was an absolute pleasure and delight to be involved. Yes, it was hard work and we do appreciate the efforts that were made uh, to make sure that we delivered a safe and secure Games. But I think for the vast majority of officers, it was one that will be, will be something to remember for, for quite some time. Question number three, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, before I give my question, can I draw your attention to my register of interest? Last summer, I spent some time out in Kurdistan as a guest of the Patri Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, which may have a relevance in the, the question that I'm about to ask. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will, be, it will provide an update on how it will support humanitarian efforts in Iraq in light of the UK Parliament's approval of airstrikes in the country. Minister Hamza Youssef. The brutality of the so-called Islamic State or ISIL is beyond question and the Scottish Government supports international efforts to support the people of Iraq, Syria and the wider Middle East region. That will only be possible through a long-term strategic approach 
led by regional partners, which includes tackling radicalisation at home and abroad, and efforts to cut off ISIL sources of finance and weaponry. In response to the international humanitarian crisis, which continues, uh, we define our response to those on a case-by-case -case basis, usually with the launch of a DEC appeal, for example, the £200,000 this government gave to the DEC Syria appeal. We'll continue to monitor the situation carefully and we'll offer where appropriate support. We've already written to the UK government to this effect. Bob um, President officer, I believe there is a role for air support from the international community in order to relieve a devastating humanitarian crisis and to help communities in the Kurdish regional, region of Iraq and beyond, including Syria, to defend themselves. Furthermore, had the Iraqi government not blocked earlier efforts of the KRG to put it properly arm its Peshmerga, then the situation may never have got so dire. Unfortunately, the UK government on Friday gave an open-ended commitment in Iraq for years without any real consideration of future peace and st stability. Will the, cabinet, sorry, will the minister make representations to the UK government making the case for proportionate and targeted use of air support specifically for the purposes I have outlined, as well as making a strong case to any future peace must include support for the Kurdish regions in both countries, including supporting stable, democratic self-government and ensuring that they have a capacity to defend themselves in the future, therefore averting future humanitarian crisis. Can I just say to you, Mr Doris, you were well wide off your first question, which my understanding is about humanitarian efforts in Iraq. Minister? I think the, uh, my, my colleague, actually, Angus Robertson MP, made this point during Friday's debate in the House of Commons. He said the UK must not equivocate in its support for the Kurdish regional government. They must be supported in the Scottish government, but also uh, support that as well. In terms of military action against ISIL, that must be carried out, as I say, with a long-term strategic plan, which, of course, must include a plan for peace. Uh, what we were presented with uh, from the UK government was lacking in those elements. An open-ended uh, bombing campaign alone will be counterproductive. Uh, in terms of Syria and the Kurds uh, in, in Syria, the global community must uh, redouble its efforts to find a long-term solution to that civil war uh, in that country. Any political solution which must be alongside any military solution uh, must be based on a human rights uh, approach that protects the rights of all communities, of course, including uh, Kurds uh, in Syria. As a government, we will, of course, support action that comes with those long-term strategic plans. A plan for peace, of course, is legal within the international uh, framework and also our strong preference that that is led by regional partners. Uh, the First Minister will write to the Prime Minister this week to highlight the Scottish Government's concern uh, regarding the UK's, uh, vote, uh, UK Government's vote for military action against ISIL without that specific timescale, without a plan for ensuring peace and without a long-term strategic vision. Lewis MacDonald, can I ask you to keep it to humanitarian efforts in Iraq? Certainly, President Officer, and for the avoidance of doubt, can the Minister confirm then what his position is in relation to United Kingdom government assistance of all types to the Kurdish population of Northern Iraq? Uh, yes, Minister. Uh, uh, yes, as I say to Lewis MacDonald, we support uh, the strengthening, uh, giving support, training and so on and so forth to the Kurdish regional government. We have been uh, very supportive, we understand their needs, but any action uh, any military action has to have, of course, a legal basis, which, uh, which we know it does, but it has to have a long-term strategic plan. That long-term strategic plan has to include a plan for peace, has to include, of course, an exit strategy as well. Uh, that was what was missing on the vote on Friday. The vote on Friday did not separate actions to support the <coughs> Kurdish uh, away from the general situation in Iraq, so we had to look at the, 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 the action as a whole, and therefore we could not support that action because we think it would be counterproductive as opposed to helping the people on the ground, be they... Kurds in, Kurd in Kurdistan, of course, the wider Iraqi population. Patricia Ferguson, humanitarian aid in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if I could ask the Minister, Presiding Officer, what humanitarian support the Scottish Government is providing to Iraq and whether it has offered to support the efforts of the United Kingdom Government in that respect? Humanitarian aid to Iraq, Minister. Uh, yes, uh, Presiding Officer, I wrote to uh, Hugo Swire, uh, the Minister, uh, who is in charge. Uh, the Under Secretary in the Foreign, Com and Foreign Commonwealth Office on this very point that the Scottish Government is willing to provide any assistance it can. Uh, currently, Iraq does not come in terms of an international development uh, budget, uh, but I'm more than happy to discuss with members about how we uh, might uh, offer that support. But that offer was made to the UK Government uh, back in August. Uh, it continues to be the case. I'm sure when the First Minister writes to the Prime Minister, he'll also reiterate that the Scottish Government is willing uh, to help in that humanitarian effort wherever uh, we can. Thank you. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 
11023 in the name of